the turn of the century, a British anthropologist surprised his colleagues by claiming that the culture of tribal peoples like these depended entirely on how they were related to each other. One of the most important and interesting personalities in the development of scientific thought spent his working life as a don here at St. John's College in Cambridge. And although he was a shy and retiring personality, Dr. William Rivers moved with great ease between several branches of science. He started off as a doctor, did research into the nervous system and into the action of drugs on the human body, became a leading psychologist, and went on to make a major contribution to psychiatry. But it was almost by chance that Rivers developed an interest in the newer discipline of anthropology. In academic circles, curiosity had been kindled by the work of one Cambridge scholar, Sir James Fraser. His widely read book on anthropology, The Golden Bough, had caused tremendous interest in Cambridge during the 1890s. One particular topic that was being discussed in and out of Rivers' rooms was an exciting and imaginative project. An expedition to investigate the cultures on a remote group of islands in the Torres Straits between Australia and New Guinea. The expedition was to be made up of Cambridge men and Rivers was to be the psychologist. His brief was to investigate the mental characteristics of the islanders. It was Rivers' systematic approach to this psychological testing that was to bring a scientific method into anthropology. The man behind this new approach to studying native peoples was strangely enough a zoologist called Alfred Court Haddon, who'd been trying to gain support for the project for 10 years. Uh, in 1888, Haddon made an expedition to the Torres Straits on his own as a zoologist. Uh, and it was he who, studying zoology, became aware, when he came to think of it, yes, there are a lot of strange species here that are dying out, but the human beings are dying out even faster than the species. And he, he thought of uh, cultures, strange groups of people, as if they were species of animals. Undoubtedly, he had the same idea that species of animals and varieties of, of human culture are, as it were, analogous. And the things that were dying out fastest were the human cultures. Yesterday, an expedition of peculiar interest left England. Travelling scholars are often enough sent out by both Oxford and Cambridge, but this is probably the first time that a real exploring expedition has been sent out by either university. The expedition is bound first for Torres Straits between Australia and New Guinea. The straits were dotted with small tropical islands, each with its own distinct cultural features. In the recent past, the islanders had had a notorious reputation for cannibalism, which prompted a remark from the university vice-chancellor at a farewell dinner for the expedition. We have come to see the members of the expedition eat their last civilized meal, he said. Who can say how soon conditions might be strangely reversed and the members of the expedition might be the civilized food of certain of the lower orders of creation? In fact, Christianity had already been preached in the islands for over 20 years when the expedition arrived here on Murray Island, their first base. One of the deacons in the church today is Sam Passy. He is descended from an informant used by the expedition, but even he has a good idea of how things were before the arrival of a Western god. My grandfather, uh, he was the first to, he and the grandmother were the first to marry in the church when they stopped everything from, you know, put a paint there and say, all right, you husband and wife. That was all gone now. And grandfather and grandmother were the first to come into the church and get married. He, he was the high priest of heathen God. <laughs> and you might have uh, heard of Malobomai cult. Well, grandfather was the high priest of that cult. And from there, he led the life of Christian all through his sons played quite a large part in the church here. I mean, you're a deacon, yeah. here, aren't you? Yeah. And 
his son, Foy, uh, was made a deacon and then a priest. Uh, he and his cousin, Joseph Louis, uh, they were the first to, to be ordained as Anglican priests. So the father had been the high priest of, of a different set of gods? Yeah. And his son became the first Anglican priest, Anglican priest out <laughs> here. Fantastic. So, so sort of timing. It's How been a big change on this island. Very big. Yeah. Is it all for the good? Well, grandfather said to me, he, he reckoned that he was very good at serving his God. And he said, uh, his God was made of turtle shell and all that. And he said to me, your God is a true God. Why can't you worship him in a true way, proper way? <laughs> <laughs> And he was right. <laughs> This remote little island has an important place in the history of anthropology. The ancestors of this congregation provided the raw material for that early attempt to understand native culture in its own setting. A contemporary newspaper reported the aims of the expedition. Their beliefs and superstitions will be studied, it said, and in short, every variety of observation made in order to obtain a complete conception of the condition of a people at the stage of those in the Torres Straits. Each member of the expedition will have a particular department to attend to. Two of them will study native psychology, in the field as it were. Dr. Myers will attend to native music, while decorative art will be the speciality of Dr. Haddon. Mr. Ray will study the languages, while the wonderful folklore of the Torres Straits people will be recorded by Dr. Haddon himself, who already has a wonderful store of interesting stories. Some aspects of that culture still survive today, as do some of the stories. It's one of the ways that tradition on these islands has been preserved. There was an island called Me, and on this island lived Sim and Me. They live at a village called Las. They are the four children who were all boys. The dance recreates the traditional method of sardine fishing, a technique now remembered only by a much older generation. But it was a feature that was well documented by the expedition. In the Murray Islands at various times of the year, large shoals of small fish called tup come very close to the shore, usually forming dense masses which look like a dark shadow in the water. When a shoal of tup is seen in a suitable spot, two of the men cautiously advance and fling themselves into the sea, holding their poles with extended arms. In an instant, the fish are huddled together within the triangle formed by the men and the poles. This critical moment is seized by the third man, who dives into the sea and scoops up as many fish as he can. We scoop them, we use them bush rope, garden rope, I mean. Uh, uh, yeah. How long ago did you use this? Many years ago? Oh, from ages come to our time, I mean, finish. War time, what time, I mean, finish. Uh, after war, they, uh, we buy nets. Buy nets, we use net now, this thing is pampo useless now. Has everyone forgotten the old ways? No, they thinking, but they they know used to make it because you got white man net here now this time more easily. We all people we always think 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 about this thing because I mean culture culture weapon for us. They catch a sardine on a sardine hard skin one and a soft skin one. Are you teaching your sons? Yes, I always teach them to. Only young generation, they, they give up. No luck. Uh, our children days now, 
They come like you white men, white people. Yeah, easy days, but they no use cars. Yeah. Like you white men. You, everything is more easily, but you must got cars. Cars, I mean, something like habit. <laughs> habit. God give me the habit. The scientists took all kinds of facts about native life seriously, whether it was technical skills like sardine fishing or the games the natives played. The islanders were expert navigators, for although they grew their own food, their diet depended on food fished from the sea. Their technical skills in coping with their environment especially their seamanship, was never contested. But their mental capacity was. It was thought to be inferior. The scientists on the expedition tended to inquire how the natives were inferior, rather than if they were. Rivers was to distinguish between two types of thought, which in his day were believed to separate civilized man and rude savages. People like the Murray Islanders were thought only to be able to handle concrete facts. Westerners, on the other hand, could also handle abstract ideas. One apparently innocent pastime raised questions about these assumptions. A game played with a piece of string. String figures, allied to our cat's cradle, are universally played by the children and sometimes by adults. Usually one person plays it alone, in some cases using the toes as well as the fingers, and often bringing the mouth into requisition. The patterns are very varied, and many are extremely complicated in manipulation, although the final result may be simple. As he unraveled the complex maneuvers of their string games, Rivers began to challenge this naive concept of inferior mentality. Several of the movements were so complex that they obviously involved memorizing intricate abstract forms. They were catalogued in detail. The house that was the expedition's first base is now a ruin. It must have been a strange scene to witness those six Victorian scholars using interpreters, pursuing their own particular scientific interest, right in the middle of daily native life. It was a breathtakingly ambitious project to attempt in the relatively short period of time that they spent here on these islands. Languages, customs, activities, technical skills, music, mythologies, disease profiles, even the games that the natives played were recorded and described. They also made what is a now famous collection of objects from native life, both the fantastic and the mundane. These were eventually to fill 40 crates which were shipped back to England. But apart from the usual notebooks, artifacts and photographs, those crates contained two kinds of data that hadn't usually been brought back from the field. These were the sound recordings that they made using wax cylinders and the first anthropological cine film footage ever to be shot. Like so much of the early material shot by the pioneers of cine film, most of the Torres Straits footage has been lost damaged beyond repair before the need for conserving film stock was realized. Of all the fascinating ceremonies and activities that they witnessed, only a tantalizing fragment of film remains. Fortunately, more of the sound that they recorded has survived. By the aid of a phonograph, records of many songs were secured, and these have been subjected to detailed examination. Some of the songs are religious and ancient, others relatively modern. Some are sung at games, others at dances. The natives of the Torres Straits were recorded in their own language, speaking phrases, reciting mythologies, and singing their songs. But River's task was examining the mental characteristics of the islanders, and this he did by examining their senses, 
and he started with the one he knew most about, vision. He'd taken along with him the latest apparatus for examining visual acuity and spatial and color perception. After several weeks, he thought that he was observing a pattern of differences emerging in the way that the Murray Islanders perceived and named different colors. What accounted for these differences? Well, one of the possibilities that occurred to Rivers was that the variations in native color perception, that is the way that they saw, described, and named different colors, might run in families. To evaluate this, he had to find out exactly how people were related to each other, and so he went about collecting family trees or genealogies. Several things impressed him. First of all, the people of this island had an extensive and precise knowledge of exactly who their relatives were, both living and dead. They could trace their family trees back many generations with great accuracy. Then he noticed that the way that they grouped or classified their relatives was different from the way that he was used to. But most interestingly of all, he realized that the categories that they used to describe their relatives, aunt, uncle, cousins, mother, father, brother, and so on, weren't just simple biological expressions about how people were related to each other. They gave insights into the way that social life itself was organized. It's obvious that Rivers was collecting genealogies very early on. This is one of the volumes of the expedition's reports, and here are all those pedigrees that were recorded on Murray Island. Chief, can you tell me what these names are down the side here? Uh, that's not the name for the village. So, so these are all the, the village names. The village name. Would you know a man called Arno as an ancestor of yours? Ancestor. Yeah. My ancestor. And in which way have you descended from him? Harry. Down through Harry and then yes. through Tau. And you're descended from this line. From this line. How many generations back can you name your family? Fifth. Five or six generations, mm. right. And you know exactly who their brothers and sisters were and their children? Yes, I know. And you can name all of those? Mm. Sam, come and sit yes. beside me. Yeah. What village do you come from, Sam? Giar. Giar. Yeah. Now, where is that? G. There were a lot of villages. Ah, Giar. Now, who's the most distant ancestor, male ancestor, that you can name? Coit, first one, not this one, the second one. This Coit. is Coit number two. And what was your father's name? George. Yeah. And I can tell you that his father was Pussy. Yes. And his father was you? It says the you, but we call him Gamala. We call him Gamala. So that, that name wasn't quite correct. It wasn't correct. And his father was Kaisamu. Kaisamu. I soon found that the knowledge possessed by the natives of their families was so extensive and apparently so accurate that a complete collection of the genealogies as far back as they could be traced would be interesting and might enable one to study many sociological problems more exactly than would be otherwise possible. Doug, if you wanted to marry someone in your own village here, is that a good thing? Well, not really. Uh, our father answered, I would say, uh, marry someone from outside another village so that they uh, can exchange ideas and culture and even uh, tradition. Uh. So if today someone wanted to marry someone in their own village, the old people wouldn't be too happy about it? Yes, that's right. The importance of what anthropologists now call kinship patterns had been discovered. Rivers began to develop a way of mapping out the basic social structure of a community. And with characteristic scientific enthusiasm, he gave it a name. He called it his genealogical method. The importance of what he did was this very close analysis of how people in a community are related to one another, both in genealogical descent and in marital relationships and learning from this, realizing that from this, you could deduce all sorts of other things by looking at the way 
the way they described the situation, the people you were talking to, how they described the situation, as distinct from how you saw it as a European observer, you could then, as it were, gain insight into how their classifications, how their system of ideas, you were, you were making, getting an insight into the psychology of the way they thought about their own society. And this for him was very important and clearly is very important. And it is this idea that you could present material systematically, which really is Rivers' big contribution to our subject. Rivers left the Torres Straits impressed with the potential of anthropology for discovering more about human nature. In many ways, from now on, psychology was to take a back seat. He wanted to see if this genealogical method was of any use in understanding other cultures. And he was to go to an entirely different setting to test it. In one of his summer vacations, Rivers came out to Egypt to visit colleagues from the Torres Straits expedition. One of them was working on an archaeological dig. Rivers was a naturally curious man, and while he was out here, for example, he couldn't resist the opportunity of testing the color perception of some of the Egyptians working on the dig. On his way back through Cairo, he called on a fellow member of his Cambridge college, a man called Grafton Elliot Smith, who was visiting professor of anatomy at Cairo University. A passing remark that Rivers made about some of the features he'd seen on the Egyptian mummies at the archaeological dig was to send Elliot Smith off on an intellectual trail that was to cause a great divide in the world of anthropology. Elliot Smith developed a theory of diffusionism which suggested that the entire cultural history of the human race could be traced back to the ancient Egyptians. He claimed that they were responsible for the major features of cultural life all over the world and that these had spread outwards by a process of diffusion. This unlikely theory that was seeded in Cairo was unfortunately to infect Rivers' later work. But it was his own ideas that preoccupied him at this time. He wanted to put his genealogical method to the test. And to see just how much information could be gained about social organization, he needed to apply it in another culture. The people whose manners and customs I'm about to describe live on the undulating plateau of the Nilgiri Hills in southern India. Of the various tribes inhabiting the hills, the Todas excited the greatest interest. And this interest has continued partly because the people are so different from any other of the races by which they're surrounded, but still more because both they and their customs are so picturesque and in many ways so unique. Even before Rivers visited the Nilgiris in 1901, the Todas had been the focus of a lot of attention and speculation. Where had they come from? What were the origins of their religious beliefs? Why were their customs and even their clothes so distinct from their neighbors? But it was their marriage customs that intrigued Rivers even more. In fact, it puzzled most anthropologists and generally aroused a great deal of prurient curiosity. The British Empire contained a wide assortment of peoples who practiced polygyny, where men could have more than one wife. But among the Todas, it was the women who frequently had more than one husband, something known as polyandry. Now, here was something that obviously complicated the whole area of kinship and descent and cried out for a fuller investigation. What he was looking for was a small, relatively isolated community with an unusual kinship pattern. In India, he'd expected to work very much as he'd done in the Torres Straits, moving quite rapidly from community to community. But when he came up here, he found that there was so much of interest and so much that had been previously misunderstood about Toda's social organization that he stayed for five months. And that was an unusually long period of time in his day. Rivers realized that to get to know a culture, you should ideally spend as long as possible among the people. Only then could you understand those puzzling customs. 
For example, the husbands a woman might have weren't just selected at random. When a woman marries a man, it is understood that she becomes the wife of his brothers at the same time. When a boy is married to a girl, not only are his brothers usually regarded as also the husbands of the girl, but any brother born later will similarly be regarded as sharing his older brother's rights. This type of arrangement initially struck Rivers as permissive, but he realized that this wasn't a case of loose morality, more an alternative morality. It was apparent that Toda society worked perfectly harmoniously within this different set of standards. As in other communities, there were rules and expectations that surrounded Toda sexual behavior. And there was a sense of revulsion if these regulations were breached. Muchikan, what interests me is the fact that this type of marriage now no longer exists in Todaland. No. Can I ask why, if it was such a happy union, why does it why is it stopped amongst Toda women? She says, on those days, ladies are less. So that's why the two brothers can marry. Nowadays, the ladies are more. So they stopped uh, that matter. Women in Europe find it very difficult having one husband. Can you ask her how she copes with two husbands? What did she say? I, um, I, we, they liked, I also liked them, so we married to both. I want to ask Pumbache, why, if she hears from the older women that it was such a good marriage to have more than one husband, why she won't have one? Maybe she will. She doesn't like the two husbands. Formerly, amongst the Todas, a woman could also take an official lover. Yeah. What about the husband of the wife? Is he? Does he mind about this? No mind. He doesn't. If if he comes that night, he will go in the other houses. How does he know if someone is in his house? No, he will come directly. You come in the evening, then uh, they will um, meet together, then talk together, yeah, then eat to you know, one house, then he will be half from the house. Does this practice still go on? No, no, stopped. Why? Now, everybody, is, some education, some the knowledge they've got, no one likes to go there. So you're saying that knowledge prevents Toda's behaving in the way yeah. they used to behave? Yeah. Even though they used to be so happy doing it? <coughs> uh, yeah. Although Rivers learnt and used a large vocabulary of Toda words whenever he could, he never spoke the language with any fluency. To question his informants, he used interpreters, just as he had done in the Torres Straits. As he expected, Toda genealogies exposed the way that social life was regulated. The whole of Toda life formed such an intricate web of closely related practices that I rarely set out to investigate some one aspect of the people without obtaining information bearing on many other wholly different aspects. The information so gained often afforded valuable corroboration of what I had been told on other occasions and by other individuals. Rivers collected information on many different aspects of the culture, including activities he catalogued as games. One of these was a contest of strength which still takes place today. The Todas are very interested in athletic feats performed by any of their number. At many villages there's a large globular stone called a tukitka. A man should be able to lift it to the shoulder, but this can now rarely, if ever, be done. <laughs> In the course of getting to know the people, Rivers discovered a significant feature of Toda life. The ritual importance of the dairy shrines, each cared for and run by a dairyman, who was also a priest. 
and it's a feature of their social life that still has great significance today. The dairy is situated near the centre of each village, and the working day is centred on the care of the herd of sacred buffalo. They are a major Toda preoccupation. The Toda buffalo is a variety of the Indian water buffalo, but the life on the hills seems to have produced a much finer animal than that of the plains. Although thoroughly under the control of the Todas, the buffaloes are semi-wild and often attack people of a different race from their owners. The buffaloes are tended entirely by males, and males only are allowed to take any part either in the work of the dairy or in those dairy operations which are performed in the house. As rivers discovered, the dairy shrines are treated in a way designed to preserve their ritual purity. The result is that the relatively straightforward tasks of animal husbandry are surrounded by strictly observed procedures. The dairyman priest is responsible for the most sacred work of the shrines, the milking of the herd and the processing of the milk. As in other parts of India, notions of purity govern their lives. Any breach of procedure or etiquette may offend the supernatural forces. For the Todas, the highly ritualized buffalo cult is a religion, and the dairies are seen as temples. This temple at Nosh is probably the most sacred site in all Todaland. For it was in this location that their most important deity, the goddess Tarkesh, first created Todas and sacred buffaloes and divided them up between the Toda clans. She is intimately associated with this, the most significant dairy of all. And at the end of important Toda ceremonies, thanks is given to Tarkesh to ensure a plentiful supply of milk. Since River's time, the Todas have been so frequently visited and their customs so closely observed that senior members like Mutikan Toda now use the sorts of terms that anthropologists have introduced. For example, the word moiety, which describes the two groups between which all Toda clans are divided. Ten of the very largest moieties. Yeah. The ten is Norse clan, yeah. Toro clan, Kaas clan, Melgas. And this particular area is yeah. a very sacred area, yeah. isn't it? The Todas and Toda buffaloes are created in this place at North, called Mutanarman. Right here in North? Right here in North. Where, whereabouts? Near that valley, some 200 years back. 200 down, feet down here. Down in down the valley, here. yes. Uh, created by the goddess Tekish. Toda and Toda buffaloes, we are created here. This is our motherland for Todas. From here, we are uh, spread into 15 clans. That's why we are called clans in the 50s. We have got two moieties. One is five, that is called Tevilyot. The other is the ten, that is called Thoralot. These are all made by the goddess Tekis. Deities like the goddess Tarkesh were associated with the tops of the mountains that surrounded the spectacular Nilgiri Plateau, which was dotted with the villages of the Todas and their neighbors. When Rivers came out here to Todaland, he behaved strictly as an observer, as a scientific onlooker. There was no real urge to participate. It was enough to have made the effort to journey to a foreign land and investigate. Perhaps for this reason alone, or maybe for reasons of comfort, Rivers chose to stay close to his own kind during his visits. His base, Utakamund, was then one of the most fashionable hill stations of the British Raj. In his day, it was a thriving and efficient resort, designed to cater for the needs and pastimes of colonials at play. And what a comfortable life it was.
Although he travelled all round the Nilgiri Hills, he was never far from people of his own cultural background, and he stayed in one or other of the European-style bungalows dotted around the countryside. Later in his life, Rivers reflected on just how strange European kinship patterns would have seemed to an outsider. He would soon find that we use terms of relationship in a way which to him is hopelessly confused and inexact. He would find that we often apply the term cousin not merely to persons of our own generation, but to those of older and younger generations than ourselves. Betraying, it would seem to him, an almost inconceivable looseness of thought, so that he is tempted to suppose that we are not subject to the law of contradiction, but believe that persons may be of the same and of different generations. He will return to his home and announce to his fellows that the English people, in spite of the splendour of their material culture, in many ways show signs of serious mental incapacity, and that in spite of their fine houses and towns, they are the victims of the most appalling confusions of thought. When Rivers returned from a day on horseback, having questioned natives about their family ties or having witnessed the custom or ceremony, he would have tea at the Savoy Hotel and even have drinks with friends in town before dining at the UT club. It may have been intense work, but it never involved a real immersion in another culture. Rivers was aware that nearly every society places restrictions on who you can marry, and he must have been reminded of that fact when he went to St. Stephen's Church in Utakamund, right in the middle of Todaland. A list of the restrictions that applied to Rivers can be found in this book. It's the Book of Common Prayer. The list is at the back of the book as a table of kindred and affinity. And it states that a man may not marry his grandmother, grandfather's wife, wife's grandmother, and so on for 30 categories, which include mother, daughter, sister, and mother-in-law. And of course, there's an equivalent list for women. The point about this list is that for the culture that produced this book, Marriage is regulated to the extent that there are certain groups of relatives that you simply cannot marry. In cultures all around the world, anthropologists like Rivers were finding that there were prohibitions on marriage between people who are related in certain ways. Now, the fascinating thing about those prohibitions was that they weren't universal. They weren't necessarily the same as you move from culture to culture. Take Rivers, for example. He could have married any of his female cousins. His other relatives might have felt a bit uncomfortable about it, but cousins weren't prohibited as far as marriage was concerned. Now the Todas see their cousins as two distinct types. Marriage with one group of cousins is totally prohibited. The other group of cousins are not just possible marriage partners. Marriage into that group is considered ideal. Most cultures seem to distinguish between two separate groups of relatives, the kin or blood relatives and the affines or in-laws as we call them. Interestingly, in this type of Toda cousin marriage, the two groups become merged into one. The custom of infant marriage is well established among the Todas and a child is often married when only two or three years of age. When a man wishes to arrange a marriage for his son, he chooses a suitable girl who should be, and very often is, the daughter of his mother's brother or of his father's sister. The father visits the parents of the girl, and if the marriage is satisfactorily arranged, takes the boy to the home of his intended wife. They take with them a loincloth as a wedding gift, and the boy performs the salutation to the father and mother of the girl, and also to her brothers, both older and younger than himself and then gives the loincloth to the girl. Societies attach a lot of importance to marriage regulations. Marriage is, after all, a time when we roughly double the number of relatives we have and make arrangements to have even more. For the Todas, marriage is more of a process than an event, and the process starts at a very early age. But like so many important social occasions, personal anxieties often surface. <laughs> When Rivers worked with the Todas, the old marriage customs were still in operation. 
That process of marriage, which began with child betrothal, was eventually sealed by a ritual which took place when a young woman was well into her first pregnancy. About the seventh month of pregnancy, a ceremony is performed which is called the bow and arrow ceremony. This ceremony begins on the evening before the day of the new moon. The pregnant woman goes into a wood about a furlong from the village at which she is living. She is accompanied by her husband, or if she has several, by the husband who is to give the bow and arrow. The ceremony is of the greatest importance from the social point of view, as the fatherhood of the child depends entirely upon it. The ceremony focused River's attention on the fact that we all think about our relatives in both a social and a biological way. It must be remembered that in the old days, a pregnant married woman could be carrying the child of any of the brothers to whom she was married. Indeed, she could even be pregnant by her officially acknowledged lover. The significance of the bow giving ceremony is all to do with the public recognition of the fatherhood of that child. The toaders aren't interested in exactly who made the woman pregnant, but what does concern them is who is going to be the social father responsible for bringing up that child. The man who is going to feed, clothe, discipline, educate, and generally take care of the child. The man who gives the bow and arrow is the father of the child for all social purposes and is regarded as such even if he has had nothing to do with the woman before the ceremony. Rivers was also one of the first anthropologists to take a sophisticated look at the whole question of morality in a society with a very different approach to sexual behavior. A woman may have one or more recognized lovers as well as several husbands. She also may have sexual relations with dairymen of various grades. So there seems to be no doubt that there is little restriction of any kind on sexual intercourse. I was assured by several toaders, not only that adultery was no motive for divorce, but that it was in no way regarded as wrong. It seemed clear that there is no word for adultery in the Toda language. I rather suspected that according to the Toda idea, immorality attaches rather to the man who grudges his wife to another. From River's point of view, they were a survival from the past. And he thought of them as, as, as evidence of what had happened in the past. He could reconstruct history from looking at them. Now, this side of things is no longer felt to be very important. What was significant, though, that he had a community here which was so small numerically that he could, in effect, by pursuing this game of uh, who is related to who, how, is, how are they related, map out in genealogical terms the whole community. and. Johnny Nelly does this, as far as one knows, when, when retrospectively it would appear there were very few people left out. After his work with the Todas, Rivers got involved with those theories that claimed that all culture had originated in ancient Egypt. By going to do some more research, this time in the South Pacific, he was convinced that he could discover something of the history of cultures. His major priority was to record the kinship patterns of every island society in Melanesia by using the genealogical method. Sailing around on the London Missionary Society's vessel, the Southern Cross, he summoned natives on board wherever the ship docked and asked them about their kinship patterns and the kinship patterns of any other societies that they'd visited. Rivers was desperate to record these facts because he felt that this kind of local knowledge was fast disappearing. This practice may have amused the islanders but it certainly amused his expatriate friends and colleagues around the South Pacific. A missionary companion on board the Southern Cross recorded his own amused bewilderment in a poem that was found among Rivers' papers after his death. Anthropological thoughts. Now how, said he, if I may ask, about your cousin's mother? Would she attempt the simple task of speaking to your brother? Ah, yes, just so, but if she were your mother's uncle's sister, how would your cousin's sister's aunt address her when she kissed her? Yes, that's a point I meant to add. Your nephew's cousin's father, if he and uncle's sister had, and neither of the two are mad, would he respect her rather? 
For if your father's mother's son were nephew to your mother, I really cannot understand why she should call him brother. Alas, alas, for just before the doctor's mind could grip her, a shout of laughter issued from the cabin of the skipper. All his research out here in Melanesia led to the work that he was most proud of, his book called The History of Melanesian Society. It reflects his ambition that one day anthropology could become a science. But in fact, it wasn't good science, it wasn't good history, and it was an unfair burden to place on the genealogical method, that device that he'd uncovered for looking into the workings of a society. His hopes that the genealogical method would actually reveal the history of a society through its kinship patterns now seem ridiculous. But he was aware of the impact the new subject was having. I'm one of those who believe that the ultimate aim of all studies of mankind, whether historical or scientific, is to reach explanation in terms of the ideas, beliefs, sentiments, and instinctive tendencies by which the conduct of man is determined. This conduct is also determined by the social structure of which every person, whether he forms an element in a great empire like ourselves, or is only a member of some rude, savage tribe, has to feel, think, and act. It is possible to study the social setting in itself, and that is the place which I believe social organization occupies in the study of human culture. Rivers was one of the first scientists to realize the problem of bias that the observer brings to the subject of his attention. Whether this was anthropological questioning, the regeneration of severed nerves, a famous experiment he performed back in Cambridge on fellow Dr. Henry Head, or evaluating the effects of drugs on the brain. What stands out is his attention to method and that endeavor to be as objective as possible. The First World War provided him with the most harrowing of research material. Trench warfare had produced a devastating array of psychological trauma. When Rivers, as a former psychiatrist, was called upon to help treat shell shock, he realized that it was often the minds of the victims that were as damaged as their brains. He found that the traditional medical approaches were largely inadequate and introduced the new psychoanalytic approach to treating patients. Ideas that had the same sort of revolutionary impact on psychiatry as he had produced on anthropology. But really there's a very big change in 1900 after the Torres Straits expedition followed by the Todas and rivers is changing the whole climate. He doesn't actually achieve very much in doing so, but he is, without rivers, without what came afterwards, after 1922, would have been impossible, it seems to me. He represents a landmark in the sense that if you go behind rivers, the subject is one kind of subject. If you come after rivers, it's another kind of subject. Rivers died suddenly in 1922 at the age of 58. He was mourned by a wide circle of friends, which included professional colleagues, politicians, novelists, grateful patients and poets, one of whom, Siegfried Sassoon, wrote of Rivers returning to him after his death. O oh, fathering friend and scientist of good, who in solitude one bygone summer's day and in throes of bodily anguish passed away from dream and conflict and research lit lands of ethnological learning, even as you stood, selfless and ardent, resolute and gay, so in this hour in strange survival stands your ghost, who I am powerless to repay. He once said that he hoped his epitaph would read, he made anthropology a science. But anthropology hasn't become the science that Rivers anticipated. There are no experiments and no laws, and most anthropologists today feel there never will be. But it has been strongly influenced by science. Rivers brought a systematic and methodological approach to working with other cultures in the field and in so doing discovered the importance of those kinship patterns in the makeup of social structure. This is his gravestone in a Cambridge churchyard. He didn't get the epitaph he had hoped for. It simply states that he was a fellow of his much-loved college St John's. Although William Rivers didn't make anthropology a strict science, he left it at least a respected pursuit. Thank you.